and good evening hello and uh, <laughs> welcome my name is john berryman and this is my wife sally sally and we are here for the next uh, half an hour or so probably a little bit longer mm -hmm. we're introducing you to some great teaching and videos uh, about our health but yes. please remember we are not health professionals so anything to do with your health please consult your gp yep and uh, this is for information and we hope you find some of it useful we have certainly uh, had some great testimonies back from different people and there will probably be one in a moment yes yeah i hope so because they're really good aren't they yeah <laughs> it's really so, really encouraging to see how people have um, really taken this on board and it's made such a big difference to their lives so before we start let's roll one of those testimonies right now okay i would say that it's um the beginning, the first bit is the hardest, it is actually initially taking the step. Because uh, I remember Graham phoned me up and, and said to me about it, and I thought, well, I can't, I can't, oh, I've got too much on at the moment. But actually, once me and Susie made that first step, we cleared out our cupboards, we got rid of all the stuff that weren't good, um, and we watched the film as well. The film was absolutely brilliant at the beginning, and it really sort of helped us to make that first step. And then once making that first step, you just carry on and it becomes a way of life. Would you say your food bill's gone up or down? I reckon slightly up, um, but we was eating a lot of rubbish. I mean, it's not until you actually look at me what you're eating, it's just, oh my goodness, that's, that's not good. Um, whereas now, you know, in fact, even like when we're in Lidl's or wherever and, and we're doing our shopping, it's like our trolley's looking healthier. It's like beef and there's, there's, there's proper food and, you know, it's, it's wonderful. So it's a little bit more, but definitely nothing to worry about. Um, and then to be honest as well, I don't go during the week getting little bits and pieces. And if I was to probably add them up, it's probably a little bit less. So, yeah. Isn't it great? Yeah. yeah Isn't it great was, to hear so good. stories about mm. change lives from Be Healthy Church? Mm -hmm. Well, you are so welcome to this uh, uh, course. And uh, if you like it, make sure you share it with friends. Uh, all the links to the uh, YouTube uh, videos are on the YouTube channel. You can find where we get videos from. And any that we can't show because of restrictions, uh, we'll put some in there as well. So you can, you can still link, follow links. So you can look for them yourself. Exactly. You yeah. And uh, you might want to re-watch. Well, you can re-watch the whole program. And share it with friends, whatever. Mm -hmm. So BHC, this is Be Healthy Church. And it's all about... Real, real life, real faith, real friends with real food. Absolutely, because I like food. Do you like food? Yes. <laughs> we like eating. We do, we like eating. But we don't want to be piling on pounds. And, uh, and we want to have a healthy inside as well. Yeah, it's not just about how you look, it's making sure that our insides are healthy. Mm. And John 10.10, 10, from the Bible, we do use bits of the Bible in this uh, course, uh, but it won't do you any harm. Um, it's uh, John 10, 10 says, the thief comes to rob, kill and destroy, but I have come. That you may have life in its fullness. Hey, well done. We don't rehearse this either. <laughs> so, you, so you have to know the Bible. Anyway, healthy lifestyle is what it's all about. And uh, this is week two of Be Healthy so, yeah, Church. This is our third run through. Yep. yep. Session number three. And straight on, we've got a, a, something for us to laugh about again we've got a little clip from michael mcintyre on christmas and christians and a little bit related to food mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now December, ladies and gentlemen, it's all happening the festivities have begun we are in to the festive period which of course means huge amounts of eating for most of us. We eat more than we will ever normally eat at Christmas. It's, almost, it's a time of year to test to see just how much we can eat. On Christmas Day, I eat until the announcement. I eat until I lean back and go, well, that's it. I can eat no more. I'm completely and utterly stuffed. I can't eat another thing. I will never, ever eat again. And I mean it. Half an hour later, I'm going to have a sandwich out of all the leftovers. <laughs> Christmas. I can't believe I'm still eating. I genuinely believed I would never eat again half an hour ago. I have an amazing capacity for food. I think it's a Christian thing. Christians love to eat to excess on their holidays. Other religions starve themselves on holidays. 
Jewish people have a holiday, they starve themselves. Muslims have a holiday, they starve themselves. It's almost like Christians have had somebody look through the Bible for opportunities to eat to excess. Well, another little bit from Mac uh, Michael McIntyre. I can't promise we'll have some every week because yeah. we won't. He is good though, isn't he? He makes us laugh. Yes, and it's good <laughs> to laugh at ourselves sometimes. And, and you know, we beat ourselves up about what we've eaten in the past and we beat ourselves up about the shape we might be or how un unfit we are but we're the ones that can actually change. Yes, because it starts with me. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, another verse from the Bible says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. No, everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. Absolutely. We aren't all here for uh, uh, ever and ever. Uh, but we do have a chance to be living for eternity. And that starts right, right when we uh, give our lives to the Lord. And, but that doesn't mean we automatically fall into good health. And uh, for some, struggle with our health. And many of the problems that we have with our health are caused through our diet. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're doing this, uh, of course. So uh, please uh, learn from it. And if you don't understand it, rerun some of it or do some research for yourselves. Yeah, yeah, that's very important. Because we so, do, don't we? Yeah, yeah, and we read and we watch um, YouTube clips and yeah, we learn so we can pass it on. But it is good to learn for yourself as well. And, and when you understand how food affects your life, it, it really will change your whole uh, life. And uh, you don't have to be addicted to it. Just yeah, a little thing. Yeah. Did anybody, will talk later, but hopefully you, some of you have managed to watch the magic pill, the video. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the documentary, and it's, it's uh, really, really good. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to watch it, please can I encourage you to watch it. Mm -hmm. um, because there's no question there'll be things in it that you didn't realize. No. And... Uh, the, uh, the, a lot of the things we talk about over the next few weeks that are, that are actually mentioned in the film uh, about what is right to eat, what is good to eat, and what we should avoid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're going to look. Uh, uh, at, at, it's more than about just being overweight. Now, uh, this TED Talk uh, is actually uh, from someone who uh, discovered, well, who was trying to find out why his mother... Uh, went down with dementia and uh, uh, it is very very interesting now again this isn't scientifically proven this guy did some research himself and what he found out I believe is true yeah so have a listen to this TED talk what was Venice Beach before Hi everybody, I want to begin with a quick little exercise if you will indulge me. I want you all to close your eyes, don't worry, this is not going to be a meditation. Just close your eyes for a few seconds. And I want you to picture somebody that has dementia, okay? What does the term dementia evoke for you? Maybe you have a relative with a disease, maybe you've seen a documentary recently, there's no right or wrong answer. Just get that image in your mind's eye. And now I want you to open your eyes, and if the image that you had in your head looks something like the person that you see on screen in front of you. I want you to raise your hand. All right, that's quite a bit of people. That's quite a bit of people. Now I want you to raise your hand if the image that you had in your head looked somebody like the person that you see on screen now. Okay, much less people. This is my mother, and her name is Kathy, and she has dementia, and I love her very much. And when I had to come to terms with the fact that my mom uh, was showing the initial signs of memory loss in her 50s a couple of years ago, it was an incredibly traumatic experience for me. And it's still to this day incredibly heartbreaking to have to uh, acknowledge. But because I couldn't chalk up what I was seeing in my mom to typical aging, clearly she's not the picture of a person succumbing to the ravages of time, I decided to learn all that I possibly could about the ways diet and lifestyle mediate risk for neurological disease, brain health, and ultimately brain function itself. 
Now, what I learned shook me to my core. You see, I thought, like you guys, that dementia was an old person's disease. You see, not only is dementia not a normal aspect of aging, but it begins in the brain decades before the first symptom of memory loss. If you make it to the age of 85, you have a one in two chance of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. That's 50%, those odds are not very good. And unfortunately for my generation, millennials, well, we're the first generation in human history that's gonna reach the age of 90, according to the Stanford Center on Longevity. Now, I think I speak for many millennials when I say that generally, you know, we believe science has our back, right? 90 is a long ways from now. By the time I get to that age, we're gonna have some kind of pharmaceutical cure, ultimately not something I have to worry about. Well, unfortunately, Alzheimer's drug trials have a near 100% failure rate. Let that figure sink in, okay? That's worse than the failure rate for cancer drugs. I mean, those are dismal uh, statistics. Therefore, unless we can prevent this disease, one in two millennials will have it, which is pretty heartbreaking. Now, for the past century, the conversation surrounding Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia, has been one dominated by doom and gloom. And that's because since 1906, when Alzheimer's disease was first coined and named by the physician Alois Alzheimer, 90% of what we know about the disease has been discovered only in the past 15 years. So that is to say, this is a rapidly evolving field of science, and while we don't yet have all the answers, there's still no cure, I wish we had a cure, we do have enough information to say that today, for a significant proportion of people, it is a potentially preventable disease. Here we have a statement written in 2014 by 109 leading scientists and clinicians around the globe stating very plainly that in 2014, we had enough evidence to say that dementia and Alzheimer's disease is a preventable disease. And just this year, for the first time at the Alzheimer's Association's international conference, it was acknowledged that one third of dementia cases may be preventable. And depending on what literature you review, even more may be preventable as well. This is just the statistic that was most recently published in the journal Lancet, which is one of the top medical journals in the world. And here we have coverage from that same event alluding to the notion that a field is now looking for hope in an area once thought impossible. Now when it comes to our diets and our lifestyles and their impact on our health, it's been said that our genes load the gun while our choices pull the trigger. So I became obsessed with trying to understand what it is about the modern world that makes it so likely for our choices to pull the trigger on diseases like Alzheimer's disease. So I did a deep dive into the literature, and I looked at parts of the world like in Ibadan, Nigeria, home of the Yoruba people. Now there, the most common and most well-defined Alzheimer's disease risk gene that in the United States puts somebody at anywhere between a two and 14-fold increased risk for developing the disease, there has little to no association with Alzheimer's disease. So in other words, if you live in the United States and you are genetically at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, you might move to Ibadan, Nigeria and see that risk disappear. So I started thinking a lot about evolution and the kinds of diets that our ancestors might have consumed during the time in which our brains evolved the magnificent supercomputer that each one of us is heir to, this incredible legacy. And I realized that for two million years, our ancestors ate in a way that led to the evolution of our brains. That's pretty amazing. But then, 10,000 years ago, something happened. We turned our backs on that diet. We went from being hunter-gatherers, eating according to seasonal availability, the world was our buffet. We consumed, we got our nutrients from the 50,000 edible plant species that there are around the world, and we became settlers, essentially becoming slaves to the few crops that we could domesticate. Over time, our brains lost the volumetric equivalent of a tennis ball. So let me just rephrase that so you really get it. We ate a certain way for two million years that led to the evolution of our brains, and then we turned our backs on that diet. And this ultimately paved the way for the fact that today, 60% of the calories that we consume worldwide come from three plants. Three plants, wheat, corn, and rice. Perhaps even worse, 50 years ago, these crops became the basis of our dietary guidelines, where for the first time in human history, human beings were told how to eat. 
We were told to base our diets on healthy whole grains. I mean, I grew up, the food pyramid, which is now debunked, existed, telling me that if I wanted to be healthy, I needed to load up on anywhere between six to 11 servings of grains per day. And today, the advice is still given that to be healthy, we need to incorporate grains in every meal. Well, when we look at research like what was recently published by Cochrane, which is an organization that has a partnership with the World Health Organization and is known for their unbiased, systematic reviews of medical research, we see that there is no evidence to suggest that eating grains, including whole grains, improve our health. Now, in this research review, they looked at a certain kind of a trial. They looked at a randomized control trial. Now, randomized control trials are the only kinds of trials that can show cause and effect which is why this research is so important. But perhaps the most insidious thing about these three grains is that today they're pulverized and packaged and sold to us in processed foods that line our supermarket aisles. These ultra-processed foods now make up 60% of the calories that we consume worldwide. When we consume these exact kinds of foods, they set off the equivalent of a forest fire in the body, and the brain sits directly downwind of that fire. That fire that I'm talking about, that's called inflammation. And inflammation directly accelerates brain aging and worsens pre-existing disease states. Now, our bodies have an incredible capacity to repair from inflammation. Right? That's what's so great about being a biological entity. You know, our bodies are so smart. But the problem is our bodies need the proper ingredients to be able to repair from inflammation. Unfortunately, today, 90% of Americans are now deficient in at least one vitamin or mineral. Why do you think that is? Well, that's because we're basing our diets around not only these ultra-processed foods, but processed foods made from these three crops, which are pretty scarce when it comes to nutrients. They're calorically dense but they are not nutrient-dense, which is a key differentiator. The other thing that these foods do very well is they send levels of blood sugar through the roof. And when blood sugar is elevated, an ancestral hormone in our bodies also becomes elevated. That hormone is called insulin, and insulin is the body's chief fat storage hormone. The fact that we're relying so much on these kinds of foods is why, for the first time in history, there are more overweight people walking the earth than underweight. Now, the other thing that insulin does really well is it turns your fat cells into the equivalent of a subway turnstile in midtown Manhattan during rush hour. Basically, calories can flow into your fat cells, but they can't come out. Now, this is very problematic because there are certain organs in our body that have evolved to use fat and use it remarkably well, in particular, the brain. The brain loves to use fat for fuel. In fact, I call fat our body's birthright fuel. You see, when we're born, human babies come packaged with an unusual amount of fat. Our fatness rivals that of baby seals, actually. We come packaged with a really high percentage of body fat. I don't mean to make any babies in the audience insecure. <laughs> if there are any babies in the audience, I apologize. But it's actually fascinating why it's believed we come packaged with so much fat. You see, the human baby is born with a half-baked brain. We complete our development in the world. This is often referred to as the fourth trimester. If we were born cognitively with the skills that some of our simian ancestors are born with, our gestation would be twice as long. This is one of the reasons why human beings are so smart. We complete our development in the world, and it's thought the fat that we come packaged with serves as a sort of mophi for the developing brain. The developing brain is incredibly energy-hungry, too. This is why that's so useful. The newborn brain uses 90% of the baby's metabolic rate. So that means that 90% of the oxygen and calories that the baby is consuming goes to fuel its brain. But the baby couldn't possibly consume enough calories to support that, therefore, fat. In the human adult brain, the ability to use fat for fuel is not lost. In fact, as adults, our brains still love to use fat. It could almost be said, almost, that when the brain is using fat for fuel, it's not aging. And the fact that we constantly, chronically deny the ability of the brain to use fat for fuel due to our chronically high carbohydrate diets, well, this might be one of the most detrimental aspects of the modern diet. And this could partly explain why it's thought that 40% of Alzheimer's cases may be attributable to chronically elevated insulin alone. Again, insulin is the hormone that turns our cells into that subway turnstile. And this was a figure published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, which is one of the leading dementia journals worldwide. So knowing what I know about the brain and how, how to properly feed it, I've become obsessed with uh, what I like to describe as resetting my brain to its factory settings. So I like to spend more time um, with my body and brain in a low insulin state. And the quickest way, the best and most efficient way of getting your body and brain to a low insulin state is via fasting. 
Luckily, we all fast every single day, and this is when we're sleeping. So what I like to do is I like to pad my sleep by two or three hours on each side with an additional time frame in which I'm not eating. A lot of people call this intermittent fasting, but essentially, one of the main goals of intermittent fasting is to allow your body and brain to spend more time in a low insulin state. When it's time for me to eat, I opt for nutrient density, which describes food that have foods, rather, that have a very high ratio of nutrients to calories. And there's no better example of that than dark leafy greens, like kale and spinach. They have tons of nutrients that protect your brain cells and help your brain cells create energy, and they have very few calories. In fact, the consumption of dark leafy greens is associated with reduced aging by up to 11 years. I eat lots of eggs. You see, I learned that when an embryo is developing, the first structure to develop is the nervous system, which includes the brain. Therefore, an egg yolk is literally designed by nature to contain all of the necessary ingredients required to grow a healthy brain. I also eat two to three servings of humanely raised, grass-fed red meat per week. If I was a premenopausal woman, I would probably eat three to four because red meat contains an abundance of highly bioavailable micronutrients. And in fact, a lot of people today say that there's no place for meat in a healthy diet. But to that, I invoke uh, a quote from one of my heroes, Carl Sagan, who said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And researchers believe that it's not just access to meat, but cooked meat that catalyzed the growth of our brains during our evolution. I eat lots of fatty fish, salmon, wild salmon, and sardines. And this is actually my perfect plate. It's half, if not more, filled with colorful, fibrous vegetables and a piece of protein that's not just protein. It's got a ton of essential micronutrients, like DHA fat, which is one of the most important structural building blocks of the brain. We now know that the adult brain can grow new brain cells up until death. But the impetus there is, is that we need to supply our brains with the appropriate building blocks to do so. I also eat tons of fruit, but not all fruits, okay? I eat lots of avocados. Avocados have the highest percentage of fat-protecting antioxidants of any fruit or vegetable. This is really important and really key for brain health because your brain is constructed of fat. 60% of the brain, by weight, is fat, but it's a kind of fat that is highly vulnerable and prone to oxidation. We need to supply our bodies with fat-soluble antioxidants like vitamin E, I eat lots of avocados, an avocado a day. And I avoid, for the most part, modern cultivated sweet fruit. I'm not gonna stand up here, guys, and tell you that the banana on the right is toxic. It's not toxic. But today, our modern fruits are bred to contain more starch and sugar than ever before in history because we like the way it tastes. Compare the modern banana to the wild banana on the left, and you'll see the contrast is stark. And the research on fruit, okay, might surprise you. Published in the Journal of the Alzheimer's Association, it was found when looking at older adults that higher fruit consumption was associated with shrinkage of the cortex, which is your brain's gray matter. Now, researchers in this journal wrote, they compared that eating foods with high glycemic load, whether as fruit or highly refined carbohydrates may have the same detrimental effect on the brain. Now, that's, this research is really fascinating because fruit is usually associated with an overall healthy dietary pattern. But rather than just looking at diets as a whole in this research, the researchers looked at individual dietary components as well, where they came to this finding, which is very, very striking. I also consume lots of fruit juice, but only one kind of fruit juice, extra virgin olive oil, which is actually fruit juice. Extra virgin olive oil is a staple of the Mediterranean diet. It's one of the main features of the Mediterranean diet, adherence to which is associated with a robust risk reduction for Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Now, no talk about preventing dementia and cognitive decline, which is the most important topic I think there is, would be complete without a little bit of a chat on exercise. So aerobic exercise is really important. I don't do my aerobic exercise in the gym. I do it in the real world. I try to imbue my day with as much movement as possible. I'm always walking. I take the stairs whenever given the opportunity, and I bike ride whenever I can. I know you guys in Venice love bike riding. And the best thing about aerobic exercise is that it boosts something called BDNF in the brain. Remember this acronym, it's very important, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's a guardian protein, it's a guardian molecule that not only ensures the survival of your existing neurons, but promotes the growth of new ones as well. It's key for neuroplasticity. And aerobic exercise is the best way to stimulate BDNF. I also love to lift weights. Aside from making you look better naked, which it does, 
Having stronger muscles is really important for brain function and brain health. Why? Because the same exact stimulus required to grow your muscles and make them stronger also acts on your brain cells to make them more efficient. So where is the research to show that making all of these changes in your lifestyles and diets is going to be worth your time? Where's the hard data, right? Well, to answer that question, I refer to the incredible finger study, which was led by Dr. Mia Kivipelto at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. I had the pleasure of visiting the Karolinska Institute and interviewing Mia Kivipelto. And what's so great about the finger trial is that it's the world's first ever large population, long-term randomized control trial. Randomized control trials, remember, are the kinds of trials required to prove cause and effect. And what she found in this incredible trial was that in her older adult at-risk population, that by adhering to a battery of dietary and lifestyle interventions, many of which I've described already, she was able to improve executive function in her um, subjects by 83% and improve processing speed by 150%. Now this is incredible, and it's also particularly poignant for me in regards to executive function, because my whole life I've struggled with executive function. Here's a letter written by my guidance counselors in elementary school in the days before email to my parents, suggesting that I see a psychologist because I had a lot of trouble focusing my attention and tuning out distraction. And that's why all throughout my academic career, my grades were never good. That's why I went into film instead of going to med school, which is actually what I really wanted to do. If only I knew then what I knew now. So in closing, thanks to research performed by AARP, we know that brain health is important to 93% of Americans. That is awesome. What's less awesome is that very few people know how to maintain or improve brain health. So I'm trying to fill this knowledge gap for people. Because every three seconds, a new dementia case is diagnosed. Let that sink in. I mean, that's like heartbreaking. In fact, since I began speaking to you guys, 400 people around the world were diagnosed with dementia. But for me, this is not about statistics. This is about a person who I love very much, my mother. And truthfully, I would do anything that I could to get her back into the state she was before the monster that is dementia took over. But it's made me incredibly passionate about spreading this message of prevention out to people of all ages. Our cognitive health might be a choice that we make with every bite that we take. And I want to be very clear that there is no person walking the earth who is not at risk. The brain is highly delicate and vulnerable to the many insults thrown at it by the modern world. You're never too young or too old to make a brain healthy choice. And our brains really make possible all that it is that we love to do in the world. So for that reason, I hope that you'll all agree with me when I say that it's worth protecting. Thank you. Very interesting, yeah. and a lot of food yeah. for thought in uh, that. Yeah, a lot of food for thought in that, yeah, yes. And, uh, you know, it's more. It's more than uh, just putting on weight. And I think it is so important that we get this message across, because uh, running through these veins of ours, apart from the DNA of Christ, of Christians, running through these veins, uh, there's lots of uh, goodies and, uh, and baddies. And uh, sometimes uh, we, I think cholesterol has been blamed for a lot of things that actually sugar has uh, caused a problem to. Mm. And um, understanding that, we unpack that over the next few weeks as well, about what, what cholesterol does and, and the, the, the good and the bad cholesterol. And yeah, yeah, we all need cholesterol, don't we? It's a very important thing. Every, everybody needs cholesterol. Yeah, and yeah. if you didn't have it, you would die. You would die. Mm -hmm. So when they say, um, oh, you, you need to lower your cholesterol, if you had none, you wouldn't be living. No. So worth uh, looking at, but we'll show you some uh, videos and talk a little bit about that uh, later on. My body is important. Mm. Yes, it is. I don't know what we do without it. <laughs> it, it is. And, and you know, it depends. You know, <laughs> you know, the Bible, I think the Bible says three score years and ten. I can't remember where that is. No. But uh, you know, we're getting pretty close. To, well, I am. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, but I don't know. I read this morning that uh, somebody in the Bible. I think he was about 130 before he died. Oh yeah, and some of them <laughs> yeah. I think get older than that in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> um, but God expects me to manage my body, mm -hmm. and my body is God's property. Yeah, believe that one, eh? Yeah. So it's worth looking after. My body mm -hmm. will be resurrected after I die. 
Mm. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also, it says in 1 Corinthians. Mm. So we know our body is not going to be the same, but our body is here for us to look after. It is our responsibility. No one else. As Sal said just now, it's up to me. What I feed myself is up to me. And I know, you know, I hear stories all the time of people that ate the wrong things and, and, oh, I'm allergic to this or I can't eat that. And often I think it's because we're putting the wrong fuel in, we're getting the wrong results out. Yeah. Yeah. And you can be handed a plate of cakes or biscuits, but it's up to you whether you want one or not. (laughs) The trouble is... (laughs) We always used to want one. Yeah, yeah. It's quite interesting how you, how how, it, how you can change your habits. Yeah. Yep. Um, have you have ever heard of the eat badly plate? We used to. No, I've heard of the eat well plate. We used to eat it once in a while. The eat badly plate. <laughs> yeah. um, this is a great video by Zoe Harkham, and uh, it's what she calls the eat badly plate because the government had a um, uh, a plate which they still have called the Eat Well Plate. Um, But what the government and the health service have been telling us to eat for the last 50 years has meant that as a nation, we have got overweight. Larger. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mm -hmm. obesity. And unfit and unwell. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And and, uh, if you look back uh, 40, 50 years, I mean, I can remember when I started school, um, (laughs) So long can time. you remember that? It's a long time ago, <laughs> isn't it? Um, I can remember when I started school that um, you know, I don't think there was a guy that was overweight in our class. There no. might have been might have been one that I thought mm. was, and, and I probably thought he had something wrong with him. Mm, yeah, yeah, I don't remember. But you know what wasn't around thing. when we were at school? No. <laughs> Well, we did, uh, did you have pasta when you was a child? Oh, pasta and rice. No, no, mum and dad. Mom, meat and two yeah, veg. Yeah, meat and two veg. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, people might say, oh, it was boring. Well, actually, it's, oh, it's not boring if you cook right. And, and what you eat. It's Let, real food. Real food. Mm-hmm. And that's what we believe in, eating real, real food, food, proper food. That's Cornish. Sorry for those of you who don't understand what the word proper is. Proper. Proper. And uh, <laughs> we're going to uh, listen to Zoe Harkham, and she's going to talk a little bit about why she calls it the eat Eat badly badly plate. Hello, my name's Zoe Harkham and I'm author of The Harkham Diet. I'd like to do a short video on the UK equivalent of the US food pyramid. And we have something which the authorities call the eat well plate. I call it the eat badly plate. It is so far removed from a model of healthy eating, it's difficult to to believe how it could be further from that. Now, it actually started off as the balance of good health, it was called. And this plate came about in 1994, and this was known as the balance of good health. And it's going to be difficult for you to see the detail, but if you go on the internet and put in the balance of good health plate, you'll be able to see this in, in quite accurate detail. And just to see the processed food that the food industry managed to get graphically represented on this plate is quite incredible. You've even got a packet of cornflakes there. In this starchy food, they can't just let you have spaghetti. You've actually got a sugared, branded Heinz tin of spaghetti in there. You've got pizza mix, you've got white um, bread and grains, you've got here um, currant buns, which are going to be absolutely laden with sugar and white flour. Moving around into milk and dairy foods, they can't just put cheese up there and milk and stuff that naturally comes from the animals. They've got to put in sugared yogurt, um, milkshakes, um, sugared um, other substances here. You've got the fromage fray. I mean, it's just an example. You've got the probiotic drinks. Just an example of processed, sugared, adulterated foods that we just do not need to be putting into our body. This is the incredible segment. Now, what they're saying is, in terms of the weight, I mean, this is supposed to be a pictorial representation of a plate. So when we sit down for a meal, this is what our plate is supposed to look like. We're supposed to have a third in the form of fruit and vegetables. And again, if they're sugared tins of vegetables or sugared coleslaw or sugared tins of fruit, doesn't much matter to dietitians. One third in the form of starchy, fattening carbohydrates. Only about 15% in the form of dairy, but again, this can be sugared rubbish, and about 12% in the form of meat, fish, or other protein alternatives. 
Um, obviously, to, to accommodate vegetarians, these don't even have to be meat or fish. They can also be beans and pulses. You've got peanut butter here. Um, you've got tins of beans, um, baked beans, of course, which are generally very, very sugary. But then this incredible segment here, which is only supposed to be 7% of our plate, but it's supposed to be a part of our plate every time we sit down to eat. When you actually look at what happens in terms of energy density, which I have done, this 33% becomes 6% of our diet, because of course these foods tend to be very low in calories. This 33% of our plate ends up being 50% of our calorie intake. And this supposedly small segment, because of the energy density in you know, the junk here, you've got sausage rolls, sweets, um, chocolate, cakes, donuts, Coca-Cola, you know, why not have Coca-Cola on there as well? That ends up being 22% of our energy intake. Now this was the Balance of Good Health, as I said, launched in 1994. Um, they had a rebranding of it in 2007. It was relaunched in a press release September 2007, and it came out as the Eat Well Plate. Now, the branding has gone from the cornflakes, but the cornflakes are still there. You've got Weetabix. The carbohydrates in this section arguably have got even whiter. I mean, at least up there, you've got some brown bread. Um, here, it's pretty much all white bread, white bagels. Um, refined carbohydrates that break down into glucose and make you fat beautifully. And again, you've got the sugar yogurts, you've got baked beans, lovely and sugary, sugar tins of fruit and syrup. And then this junk segment with the Coca-Cola again, the sweets, the chocolate, the Battenberg cake, the biscuits, there's a Victoria sponge cake in there. And this is how our government thinks we should be eating. And if there were ever a clearer cause of the obesity epidemic than this, I don't know what it is. I mean, this just fuels obesity like we could not believe. Where is the real food on that? Where is the food that we've evolved to eat? Barry Groves does a brilliant thing in one of his presentations where he says that's essentially fructose and that's essentially glucose. And what you're saying down here is don't eat too much sucrose and sucrose at the end of the day is just one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose. So you're saying don't eat too much glucose fructose, but then you're saying eat loads of glucose fructose. I mean, we've just got it completely screwy the wrong way around. It's like we don't know what glucose, fructose, sugars break down into. There's a few more nutrients in these things than there are in pure sugar, but the body will break them down into sugars in just the same way, and they can make us beautifully fat. So I really, really passionately dislike this plate because it is making UK PLC, my fellow citizens, fat and sick and it's evil and it is promoted so aggressively by dietitians and people who believe in this nonsense, public health authorities. Next time you're in a surgery or a school, have a look out for this and just see what it is that you're being advised to eat because it's what is making us fat and sick. Please don't follow it. Listen to Mother Nature, Nature and eat what she provides instead. Thanks very much for listening. Well, thank you, Zoe. And it's a great, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Zoe is brilliant. Uh, we don't follow Zoe's uh, uh, diet all through this course. We do look at other things and that's very important, but it's a great way to kickstart a diet. Mm -hmm. And her stage one is just a, a, a brilliant way of uh, doing it. Now, what I want to know is what's on your Eat Badly plate? Yeah, it could be um, cereals or orange juice is one that people might not think is on is a badly plate. Yeah, and why is yeah. orange bad? Orange juice. Orange juice bad because it is a full it full of sugar because it converts into fructose when yeah. you drink a lot of orange juice. Yeah, yeah. and you know. Uh, uh, fructose is a sugar and there is as much um, uh, sugar in a glass of orange juice uh, virtually the same as a glass of coca-cola yeah that's now, quite a shocking yeah mm. so you might think well yes but it's an orange it's natural uh, but it is not as good for you as eating an orange oh well it's been through a process hasn't it it's processed, yes, processed. and uh, you know you might say well and some people think well there's juices of, of several oranges and, and, uh, and, uh, and so it's good. I'm getting my five a day if I drink. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if, if you drink a, a carton of orange juice and a carton of uh, apple juice, uh, you, you're not getting five a day. You're just getting some liquid sugar. 
Yes. And it's not the same as eating an apple and an orange. And if you actually want to lose weight... Don't eat apples or oranges. No. <laughs> no. And not it, to any great degree, anyway. <laughs> no. So that's, that's a real uh, interesting thing. And that will come up. We'll have a little bit of science behind it. But, but you know, you might think that meal there of baked beans, pasta, and mashed potato... A bowl uh, of soup and a carton of ice cream. It's okay. And there would have been a time when I would have gone, yum, mm. yum. Give me some of that. But the sugar content, the carbohydrates in it is colossal. And mm. if you look down at that plate, down the bottom with clotted cream. Oh, the scones. Yeah, I was still looking at the pasty. Thing. You're still <laughs> thinking about that pasty. And, and it's funny because yeah. I used to go, I used to go out to a, a church event or whatever. And I think, wow, I'd look over at the food and I think, wow, I can't wait to get into mm. that food. And I really want one of those pasties. Yeah. Sal was always a little bit more cautious about eating and stuff like that. But I would be actually looking to see what was there I could eat. And wow, I'd be, <laughs> now I actually, wow, I don't really want it. No, no. So you it's can not, change. Not tempting anymore. So let's uh, have a look. My body yes. is important. Yeah. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? No, you might have to explain that one a little bit. Well, <laughs> we are, as Christians, a part of the body of Christ. And uh, he is the head of the, of the church. Uh, mm -hmm. He is seen as, as one, uh, you know, our DNA is the same as his. Mm -hmm. If we're really Bible-believing Christians. And we should be healthy. I, don't, I, I can't remember reading a story about Jesus having a job to walk along, apart from when he was carrying the cross, uh, because he was ill. No, no, he's, yeah, he, did, so, he rested and he, yeah, um, yeah. He ate, the right, he ate food. the right food. And he's a son of God, you might say, mm. he's not going to get ill, but you know, he, he was, was human. human. Yeah. <laughs> you think we rehearse this? <laughs> we think the same, you know, you uh, notice that. Okay, so sugar. sugar is, sugar is the problem and not fat. Yeah, now that was something I had to get my head around, that fat is okay to eat. In fact, fat, we need fat. Yeah. to help us on this diet absolutely yeah but the, not sugar sugar is the bad boy yeah sugar causes inflammation and if you suffer with aches pains and inflammation mm -hmm. sugar will more than likely be the problem mm. so mm -hmm. this in this uh, little talk zoe talks about addictions and are we addicted to different things Talking about food addiction and recognising that food addiction is just as serious as alcoholism, drug addiction or people who are addicted to cigarettes. You can't go cold turkey on food, we all do have to eat, but you can go cold turkey on certain foods. For people to advise you just eat anything you want but in moderation is utter madness. There are certain foods on the Harkin diet that you are going to have to avoid, but that's because you're addicted to them. And phase one of the diet works through your addiction. So after just five days, believe me, five days, you will no longer feel addicted to all the things that you feel you can't do without at the moment. Currently, you probably feel addicted to chocolate or cereals or bread or confectionery, sugar of any kind. It's always carbohydrates that we feel addicted to. I can take away that addiction from you in as little as five days. That can totally change your life in such a short period of time. Well, another great little video. Zoe's doing well tonight. And, and, uh, and uh, she doesn't get charged. We don't get charged for showing her videos. No, she no, she just does it. She for... might She might make it anyway. It's on YouTube. She does some great videos. Yeah. We, we don't show them all, um, but uh, uh, she is very good. And she studies what she talks about, which is what we like. Mm. So, mm. What is one of the answers? Well, lose weight, gain health with the Harkham diet. And, mm -hmm. and that's, you have to start somewhere. And uh, I don't know if any of you set goals last week, mm -hmm. but a goal is really helpful. Uh, if you don't have a goal, you don't know where you're heading. If you don't set out to, I'm going to head for Penzance, you end up going to Truro, you know? <laughs> but you need a goal. Yeah, we all need a vision. And uh, you know, yeah. we, we said last week, they had a vision, the people perishing. And uh, we need to have a goal set before us. And, uh, and you know, if Zoe can help us get started on our weight loss journey or our health journey. Yes, if, you're, if we don't need to lose weight, it's still a good idea to get healthy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, believe you me, 
there are a lot of thin people that are eating far too much sugar mm -hmm. and too and and it will catch up because you uh, i think it's something like 30 percent of, of the population in the uk that are getting sick with uh uh metabolic syndrome issues you have to look that one up because uh, i haven't got time to explain it all now uh but look it up uh, are actually normal weight they're not overweight sugar mm. is bad news folks mm. and uh, we need to avoid it yeah so what is one of the answers well there's there's several but on this particular uh week one and two we're talking more about the harkham diet and uh, zoe uh this is a little uh, advert for a little bit more about the harkham diet okay her uh, books and things yeah <laughs> It's a well-documented fact that the Western world is getting considerably fatter and consequently much unhealthier. The obesity rates just in the United Kingdom have risen dramatically over the last two decades, along with conditions that are linked to obesity, such as diabetes. Today we know more about the human body than ever before. Yet nobody has been able to crack the real reason for this dramatic population weight gain or what practical, effective steps to do about it. But now, is there an answer? Obesity expert Zoe Harkham has been researching why this situation has occurred, originally to explain her own eating disorder she had when studying at Cambridge University. Her first major book was Why Do You Overeat When All You Want Is To Be Slim? which launched the Harkham Diet. Subsequent books such as Stop Counting Calories, a recipe book, and another aimed specifically at men explain more benefits of the diet, such as rapid weight loss while still being able to enjoy nutritious food. What Zoe Harkham teaches goes against what most of us consider to be true. For example, to lose weight, you have to eat less and exercise more. Not true. Eat special low-fat diet foods and you'll lose weight. Not true. Fat is bad for you. Not true. Count the calories of everything you consume in each day and stick to your limit and you won't get fat. Not true. Hello, I'm Zoe Harkham, and if you think I'm going to have a tough time explaining those myths, it's going to be very easy. I didn't set out to design a diet that would lose people 17 pounds in five days, and yet that is what has happened. I set out to design a diet that would help people overcome food cravings and food addictions, and it certainly does that. Researchers at the University of Florida found that people would rather be blind, deaf or lose a limb than overweight. And yet two thirds of us in the developed world are overweight, one quarter obese. And it's the last thing that we want to be, so why? It just doesn't make sense. The advice we're given is just eat less, do more, or quite specifically the advice is cut back by three and a half thousand calories and you'll lose a pound of fat. And yet people are trying to do this every day and it just isn't working. If it really were that simple, we wouldn't have an obesity problem, let alone an epidemic. You'll learn that we have been given completely the wrong official advice. Even the five a day mantra is fundamentally flawed. Even exercise is optional when it comes to weight loss. Sweating it out in the gym will actually contribute little to losing the pounds. No more calorie counting, no more meal replacements, no more hideous shakes that leave you starving and wanting to eat real food. This is all about real food. We'll get you started very soon. Yes, it's absolutely true. You can have bacon and eggs for breakfast, an enormous tuna salad with boiled eggs for lunch, stir fry for dinner, steak for dinner, Dinner, berries and cream, dark chocolate, red wine, you should be salivating by now. You can eat fantastic food and still lose weight and gain health. The Harker mantra is to work with your body, not against it, to result in not just losing weight but to feel fitter as well. The diet has three so-called phases, the first being only five days long, to help identify allergies and addictions that even you may not be aware of. She explains in her books and DVD that the Harkham diet is successful at helping men and women lose weight permanently, not just for the short term. 
If you've tried countless diets before and have failed to receive any benefits, the Harkham diet will be the answer, according to her thousands of followers, many of whom wholeheartedly agree with Zoe Harkham's statement that this is the last diet you will ever need. So what have you got to lose? Get cracking now, you won't be hungry, you'll be eating great food, losing weight and gaining health. So there you go, a bit of a roundup for the Harkham diet, and I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, please look it up online. She's got a great uh, a website, and all the details are there. Find it out, look it up, find out what she says about certain things. She is a doctor, uh, and uh, uh, she studies into facts. She does a lot of research, doesn't she? Yeah. yeah. And, and she doesn't get paid by any um, drug company or university or anything to do the research. No. There isn't does it a, all for us. <laughs> there isn't a food company supporting no, her. No. And, uh, uh, you know, when you go to some of these companies, you know, uh, diet companies, they have their own food products. They want to sell you the food products. Mm. You don't need a mix of foods with every added ingredient. You look at some of the ingredient list. If it's got more than three, you shouldn't eat it. <laughs> and, you know, really, and, and if sugar, really is, in, sugar mm. is in the top uh, uh, three, definitely mm. don't eat it. No. Um, but you know, if you can avoid, just go for the real thing. Mm -hmm. Make it up yourself. It's amazing what you can make up in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. That's very true, isn't it? Yeah, full of bright ideas, aren't we? Well, we keep we, trying. We'll share some some of our ideas. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in later videos, we will. We'll do our best. Mm -hmm. So afterwards, join us for a virtual coffee. You have to bring your own. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Uh, we haven't yet got the technology where we can pull that down the cable. Uh, a virtual coffee and weigh-in, but only if you want to. Yeah, and it's, and it's really good because we chat about people's um, successes and their, when they get stuck and what is the best thing to move on. And it's, um, yeah, it's good to chat these things through. It is. And uh, uh, it's on Zoom. So you can join us on Zoom and also like us, find us on Facebook, like us on Facebook, uh, 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 click the subscribe button. Many of you subscribe and then you know when a new oh, video comes on out. on YouTube. On YouTube, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so click the sub subscribe button on YouTube. And um, if you have a question, email me. Uh, and uh, if it's for Sally, I'll pass the email on. <laughs> but jb at behealthychurch.co.uk. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And if you've got a testament, testimony. Yeah, about your health or weight loss or how it's helped you. We, I mean, we really would love to be encouraged to hear that. And so would everybody else. Yeah, that would be great. Mm, yeah. And, uh, and watch out for the testimonies that we will be putting on upline, online. Upline. Uploading. Uh, yeah, <laughs> in, the, in the future. So I've yeah. tried and I and failed. I failed. Yeah, which sometimes does happen, doesn't it? Yeah. So it, there's a few reasons. We probably rely on willpower instead of God's power. And we don't have the right motivation. And we try to change on our own because we do need God's power to help us because mm. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's right. Philippians mm. 4.13. And of course, remember that if we are not losing weight, mm -hmm could be that we've not got hold of the idea of which is the right foods to eat absolutely or the combination of foods on your plate absolutely or you could be having too big of portions absolutely <laughs> there are lots of reasons and and we can talk about that in the zoom hear how other people have um got through it yeah and you know we had a message from someone last week who struggled on the first few weeks of the course to lose weight oh, yes. and then yeah. we suddenly got a message through on whatsapp or whatever that i've i've lost the one stone, stone. Yeah. and you know well, well, done. Done. well done that yeah. is fantastic huh? news yeah. and uh, but we get these uh, from different people over and over and and uh, which is great mm -hmm. and uh, we we really need to encourage one another because that's how a lot of these things work and uh, and so we are together it, it, we have a family, be health, the Be Healthy Church family. Yes, we do. And mm -hmm. uh, it's great to have people joining us from all over the country. And we've got people all over the world now that have done uh, uh, some 
be healthy church. Well, all over the world, Canada. I don't, I don't know where <laughs> else. Maybe where else? We, we don't, don't know always where else know, do we? No, we don't. But yeah. it's great to know that uh, it is making a difference on your lives, mm -hmm. and uh, that's really good. Now, just this one time, I do this in the whole course. Uh, because uh, you may or may not be a Christian, and, and we are Christian-based, and I don't apologize for that, but I thought it was important for me once to say that uh, to be born again or to experience new birth is a phrase that refers to spiritual rebirth or a regeneration of the human spirit by the Holy Spirit. And uh, it, it is, you know, apart from our, our, our physical birth, uh, it is a spiritual rebirth. And uh, if you would like to say this prayer, you can rerun this later and pray about it and think, do I really want to say it? But I'm going to say it out now. And this is the one time that we do this. And uh, it just gives people that haven't ever made that commitment that one chance uh, because it certainly changed our lives for the better. Uh, this is the prayer. And you can say it with me or, like I said, rewind later and say it by yourself. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong in my life. Take a few moments to ask for his forgiveness for anything particular that is on your conscience. Please forgive me. I now turn from everything that I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your Holy Spirit. I now receive that gift. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So if you prayed that, let us know if you prayed that prayer. And, uh, uh, but, you know, here we're about the whole life, our whole life to have life in its fullness. And uh, that starts for us as Christians, but for all of us, it's what we put on our plate mm -hmm. and what we eventually put into our mouths. Yeah. yeah. So we look forward to seeing you next week and on Zoom if you can. Yeah, so that's all folks for this week. And uh, we look forward to chat on Zoom and in one week's time, Tuesday night, 7.30. Look forward to seeing you then. Bye. Be blessed, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> That's all, folks.